Yeah. My grandparents used to have a house in Naples. It's pretty nice down there, isn't it? Very nice. Yeah. I can't believe you want to get out of this weather. <laughs> you're just, you're just going to beat it by <laughs> hours. I know. That's, that's, that's why they're legit. taking off. That's exactly. We we're supposed to leave tomorrow, and I was like, oh, we're just going to go leave yeah. tonight. Drive to Nashville or something. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce the show and then introduce you briefly, and then DC will kind of read off your bio. Okay. And then we'll just get right to it. And, uh, yeah, man, spread some positivity in the world. Let's do it. Cool. All right. All right, everybody. It's the Always Be Cool podcast at the Summit Lending Studios, hanging out with your host, Bobby Kerr, Darren Copeland. What's up, everybody? Man, we have had a phenomenal week of guests today, or this week. Today, someone really special, Royals Hall of Famer, Pitcher, closer, Jeff Montgomery. All right, here we go. So born January 7th, 1962, played college ball at Marshall and was drafted by the Reds in 1983, 13 years in the majors, mostly with the Kansas City Royals. He's a three-time All-Star, AL Saves Leader in 1993 with 45, AL Rolades Relief Winner as well in 1993. In 1998, he was the Royals Pitcher of the Year. He is the all-time saves leader for Kansas City with 304. He is also a member of the Kansas City Royals Hall of Fame. And, Bobby, I don't know if you know this, but Jeff was part of one of the most lopsided trades in Royals history coming here from the (laughs) Cincinnati Reds for outfielder Van Snyder back in 1988. He is currently the co-host for Royals Live pregame and postgame shows on Bally Sports. All around awesome guy, Jeff Montgomery. Welcome to the show, right. sir. Woo-hoo. Hey, thanks, yeah. guys. I'm so happy to be here. Right? right. I love talking baseball. I love talking about, especially this time of year. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. It gives us all a little bit of hope for the spring, for yes. sure. It gets us fired up, for yeah, sure. For well, sure. gosh, DC, you brought up some really cool stuff. The yeah. best part about this is that like I do my research, he does his research, and then we don't get together beforehand. We just come to the table and say, all right, let's just dive right in. So some of those things that he says, I'm like, man, that is such a great reminder of what an illustrious career you have. Oh, man, crazy. It was interesting. Uh, I always felt like any successful athlete, particularly, uh, it's all about consistency. Mm-hmm. And if you're a consistent performer, you're not going to maybe pop anybody's eyeballs out because you're not going to have these gaudy numbers. Uh, but I always like to say at the beginning of the year, uh, my manager could have a pretty good idea <laughs> of what he's going to get mm-hmm. you know, over the course of the six-month baseball season. Right. You mentioned a 93 th- season, um, led the league in saves in the role age relief thing. That was really cool. I felt like my best season – was 1989, I believe it was. Yeah, that was kind of your coming art, so, coming out party, yeah, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. And it's uh, it's kind of interesting how all that happened. I mean, it's uh, I was a guy who, as you mentioned, drafted by the Reds, uh, made it to the big leagues after five years in the minor leagues with the Cincinnati Reds. I uh, get traded to the Royals. I mean, just before spring training of '88, I get traded. Yeah. And growing up in Ohio, being a Reds fan, people would think, "Gosh, that had to be a heartbreaking situation getting mm-hmm. traded." You know, from your hometown team. It would be like somebody who grew up near Kansas City getting traded from the Royals, right? Right, right? But I was actually happy. I mean, I think I was probably the happiest guy in baseball because I felt like I'm coming to an organization where I got a pretty good chance to stick. To be the guy. Yeah. And I wasn't for sure if that was going to happen uh, with the Reds. So anyway, I, uh, I started the season in uh, Omaha in 88. Okay. Get called up like in June or July. I remember it was during the College World Series because we're on this long road trip. Um, because the Rosenblatt Stadium, our home uh, stadium, is where we played College World they Series. They needed the stadium, right? right? So yeah. they'd, they'd, they'd send us on a two-week road trip. Anyway, during that trip, I get called up and had a, had a pretty decent showing over the next three or four months, whatever it was that I was in Kansas City. Uh, I go home. I remember John Wathen was my manager. I go home that, that, that winter, and he said, hey, go home. You know, get ready for the season. We want you on a ball club next year. So I work my tail off, get ready for the season, go into spring training camp, ready to go. And um, we had traded – I'm sorry, we didn't trade for – we had acquired Bob Boone yeah. uh, as That's a catcher. Right. right. That's right. He came in yeah. to be our catcher in 89. And I'll never forget this. We're, we're playing against the Red Sox over in Winter Haven uh, right toward the end of spring training camp. And Booney's catching. I'm going to pitch the seventh inning. So I go in, pitch the seventh inning. And, and before I go in, Booney's like, what do you want to work on today? I'm like, I don't know. What do you think? And he goes, well, look, here's, here's the deal. He goes – your, your, your control's pretty decent, not great. He goes, your stuff's pretty decent, not great. He goes, I'm going to set up in the middle of the plate. I'm going to give you a low strike zone. 
you know, I want you to try to hit my target every time. But it's going to be a low target, middle of the dish. So I go out there, 10 pitches, three outs. Right? Really? I come in, John the Duke walk and says, I like what I saw. You got the eighth. I go out the eighth inning, 10 pitches, three outs. Dang. So Sweet. I'm like on a roll. He goes, you got another one in you? And I go, sure. I go out for the ninth. I face four batters, get three outs. So all in all, I had 10 batters. I uh, got nine outs. I probably threw like 45 pitches max, right? Right. Wow. That day, I became a big leaguer. I really. That's amazing. That was the day that things really took off for me, and I kind of established in my, in my mind that I could pitch in the big leagues consistently. And Bob Boone, very uh, responsible for that. Mm-hmm. But uh, I mentioned the '89 season. That's right. when it all started. It was mm. that day against the Red Sox in Winter Haven, Florida. That's fantastic. Because during that season, weren't you setting up Steve Farr for a while? I was. Yes, I started the season. Uh, Tom Gordon and I were the setup guys. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we pitched, you know, seventh inning, eighth inning, whatever. Steve Farr was our closer, and then. Steve, uh, the beast far, ends up hurting his knee, and he has to miss the second half of the year. So right around the All-Star break, I become the closer. Tom Flash Gordon goes into the rotation, Mm -hmm. and we both kind of took off from there. So you said that that day is kind of when you, quote-unquote, became a big leader, right? So maybe speak to the the mental part of – this wasn't like you just got some great physical gift that day, right? It was more of a mental thing. Mm -hmm. So maybe I think speak to some of the folks about how that plays into all big leaders and how important the mental strength is. Well, I've always felt like there are essentially different phases or steps that you take along the way to becoming like a bona fide surefire player at that level. First, you've got to get to the big leagues. And once you get to the big leagues, you got to prove to yourself you can stay in the big leagues. And, you know, you'll go through these ups and downs, and the ups are easy. I mean, it's like anything. When things <laughs> right. are going well, it's so mm-hmm. easy to go out there and do your job. When you're not you know, going so well, uh, that's when it's tough, especially if you're not established because you're thinking, okay, they're going to peck on my shoulder someday and say, hey, the manager needs you to see in his office, and he's sending you back to the minor leagues, right? right. So that's one phase is getting over that to where you feel like you have the ability, you have confidence that you're going to go out there on a consistent basis and perform. And then you get to the stage where, hey, from a career standpoint, I have to, uh, from a financial standpoint, I have to solidify myself. I've got a short mm-hmm. window right. to, for, to maximize my earnings and see what I can do. So that happens after two or three years. You get to arbitration eligibility, and eventually sometimes you hope to get to free agency. So you, you establish financial uh, certainty in your life and mm-hmm. for your family moving forward. So that's another stage that you kind of go. Th- and then the stage is where all of that's t- over with and all you worry about is winning. And nice. I saw that nice. happen with yeah. our guys in 2014-15, the guys that won a World Series. Right. They all kind of come to the big leagues together. Eventually, they kind of established themselves. Mm-hmm. Then eventually, they all made a bunch of money. Mm-hmm. And now all they got to do is about winning. Let's and go. they, they yeah. all were kind of going through those various together. stages or phases yeah. that I talked about mm-hmm. at the same time. So it just kind of – Kind of lightning in the bottle. Right, right. Exactly. Well, let, let's kind of go chronological order here. So uh, you came up with, with the Reds, and if I'm not mistaken, you played with – was Pete Rose your manager oh, at that time? Yes, yep. So well, Before you go, yeah. can we go ahead. talk about some of these teammates that you had on that 1987 team? We've got yeah. uh, Buddy Bell, Sal Butera, Terry Francona, Barry Larkin, Eric Davis, Paul O'Neill, Dave Parker, <laughs> Tony Perez – yeah. And by the way, Pete Rose is manager. Yeah. How, how was that? Well, the interesting thing is we finished in second place, okay? Mm-hmm. We finished in second place. The next year, or maybe a year or so afterwards, they hire Lou Pinella, and he wins the World Series with essentially that same group mm-hmm. of right. players. Right. And I, I love Pete Rose. I mean, my favorite player of all time. There will min- never be another Pete Rose in, in, in me. Mm-hmm. However, as a manager, I felt like there were certain sh- shortcomings. You mentioned – uh, Buddy Bell and Terry Francona, two players who eventually became right. major league managers. And Terry Francona, one of the best managers in baseball, would be a Hall of Fame manager. Mm-hmm. But those guys were more suited to manage than Pete. Now, Buddy Bell had an outstanding career. Terry Francona had a nice major league career, but mm-hmm. he was never a star. Mm-hmm. Right. But he learned the game. He learned because he was always – on the bench, he's always going through situations. And as a utility player, mm-hmm. you have to be pre- prepared for a whole lot of different things. And I think that's what made Terry Francona a really good manager. A lot of times you'll see catchers and oftentimes backup catchers become good managers because they're setting up bullpen the majority of the game. You know, 
going through the situations and understanding, you know, what we got, are we going to hit and run here? Are we going to bunt? Are we going to steal base? All those things, it just kind of, in their mind, becomes almost automatic and, and second nature. And Bob Melvin was a backup catcher in oh, no, a that's couple years right. here in yeah, Kansas City. And I remember right. seeing him in, a, in our bullpen, and he'd be asking questions. He'd take a little pinch hit. I mean, he would be going through these things, and it just kind of groomed him to become a manager. But, again, I love Pete Rose, but from a managerial standpoint, he just was not cut out to be a manager. So gotcha. favorite player of all time, and then he's your, your manager. What was that like as a player to have him – what, was I mean, that, was yeah. it like star study? Was that kind of an out of body experience? Like I'm really playing for Pete Rose. Well, he he was just like the guy next door. I mean, he was mm-hmm. like any other guy in the clubhouse. He made you feel good, made you feel welcome. But as a young player, you could be intimidated by a guy who mm. was a you know all time hits leader, and uh, he was very he, he had a lot more confidence, obviously, in the more experienced, the more veteran player. So as a rookie player, a young player. Uh, you certainly felt some pressure and some sure. intimidation. Exactly. No, I can see that because you went from the Reds, you get traded to the Royals. That's really cool to hear that you weren't like fully, you know, depressed that you came over to the Royals, <laughs> which is fantastic. Because I don't think a lot. I wrote this in my notes, but I think people forget, like in the late '80s and early '90s, the Royals had some pretty darn good clubs, right? And also in the early '90s. You know, you and Kaufman was shelling out some big bucks for some big time free agents as well. So, talk a little bit about that about coming over to this organization. Well, the the, the unfortunate part of the, I guess, the reality of what was going on was there were only two divisions in each league. Mm-hmm. There was American League East yeah. and American League West before the wild card, and yeah. there was no wild card. Yeah. The wild card was going to happen in 1994, the year of the strike. Mm-hmm. Okay, which we would have mm-hmm. certainly been a playoff team. Uh, that year, because of the wild card, uh, unfortunately, the strike put a you know an ending to that. But you had to win a hundred games in your league mm-hmm. in order to win, <laughs> yeah, or in your division right. in order to win a, you know, a chance to go to the postseason. And with only four teams making it, it was pretty tough. But the Royals were. I mean, we always would win upper eighties, low nineties in games. Mm-hmm. You know, as the right. thing about today, you win ninety two baseball games. I mean, you're going to be a high seed oh, in the in, yep. in, in, in Not the a problem. season, right? Mm-hmm. But that was just the way it was. And, uh, and and talking about the 94 situation, that was so disappointing when uh, everything kind of just came to a screeching halt because we were so good. We were on such a roll. I remember at one point we won 14 consecutive baseball yeah. games. Yeah. We were on our way. Um, and, it, it, and unfortunately, Mr. Coffin passed away in 93. Mm-hmm. And once mm-hmm. a strike hit and there was really no – bona fide leader or owner of the team, uh, there was a, you know... It's kind of wind out of the sails almost. It was like an utterless ship, really. Mm, really. No wind and no udder. I mean, yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. no rudder wow. there. And it It's was an just, interesting way to put it. It was just it was uh, just treading water, essentially. And, and Mr. Glass, who was chairman of the board of directors running the club, he, 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 he wanted to buy the club, but he still didn't own the club. And Mr. Kaufman mm. left a fine out on, finite amount of money behind... To subsidize a team should have losses, mm-hmm. but that money wasn't going to last long, especially at about that time, 94, 95, after the strike. A lot of the large market teams just said, hey, you know, we, we kind of wanted – the owners, honestly, they, they wanted us to go on strike because they were going to break our union. They were mm-hmm. going to break our player association. Wow. Okay, It didn't happen, okay, but after that didn't happen, the large market owners said to the small market, like, guys, we were supposed to have this salary cap, and it didn't happen. We're, we're moving forward. And they just started giving out enormous contracts, enormous wow. contracts. I remember Albert Bell got a huge contract mm-hmm. right after that all happened. It just kind of snowballed and it just kept going. So in 94, did they, did they ever come close to breaking the union at all during that, during that strike? I've said this many times. There was not one player that wanted to be the first player to cross that line. Mm-hmm. But there were literally dozens lined up to be tied for second. We were huh. so oh, close. Right. It was right. so close. Because we've got a lot of players. I mean, think about this. If you're on a 40-man roster and you've never played in the major leagues, you're still on strike, mm-hmm. okay? And guys had not you know, made hardly any money at all. Some guys had made no major league money. They were you know, minor league guys on a 40-man roster, right. and they were in situations where they couldn't afford to not have income. And it was, a, it was right. a, the lion's share of our player association was not financially secure. Mm. Gotcha. Okay, so gotcha. that meant there were a lot of players who were just, you know, really, really on thin ice with regards to, you know, making house payments and mm-hmm. finding ways to pay their bills. Right. And um, 
it was just uh, circumstantial how we end up going back to work. I mean, now Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor, she was uh, a district court judge in New York, and in, in the Player Association, we filed a grievance saying the owners have not negotiated in good faith. Mm -hmm. She essentially ruled in our favor and said, hey, you have not, you know, the, the, the first offer we got was the only offer we got, and that was before the strike, right, in, yeah. in August. Yeah. So uh, she ends up saying, are you going back to work under the old working conditions? And we did, um, but had that not happened, I don't know how much longer we could have gone. Wow. Wow. That's a what pretty a, good insight. Man. Right? Thanks for that perspective because I think it's important that people hear because a lot of people still talk about the strike. They're like, mm -hmm. I don't, I'm not into baseball anymore because right. of the strike. And it's not like every single person involved, every single player involved was just, you know, money's falling out of their pockets. And it wasn't, right. I mean, that was the perception. Well, screw mm -hmm. baseball. All these rich guys, they just want to get richer and they're holding out. That's right. obviously yeah. not. It's not black and white. So, Jeff, look, looking at like, you know, here we are 30-some years later, whatever it is, do you think Do you think that would have changed the small market teams with the salary cap? Do you think that would have helped, uh, you know, cities like Kansas City if it was a fair playing field across? across? Because obviously we you know, don't want anyone to, you know, lose salaries and, you know, miss mortgage payments back in the 90s. But, I mean, do you think that long-term would have been better for the smaller market teams? There's no doubt it would have been better for small market clubs. It, it would – the way I look at it is, um, you know, players, whether it be back in the mid-90s or players now in the, you know, 2022, 2023, I mean, you look at the salaries there are. The majority of the money, money goes to a small amount of players. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's a large market teams that can afford to give those large contracts – you win with experience. You don't always win with payroll, but you win with experience. And mm -hmm. generally, experience means payroll. Right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And some of those contracts that went out today and yesterday. Oh, they're they're crazy. But three hundred you know, plus million. But back in back in the players. day when you when Ewing Kaufman was around, I mean, he he was no stranger. I mean, he was kind of in the mix of handing out some of those big contracts. I think in nineteen eighty nine or eight or nineteen ninety, we had the largest payroll in Major League Baseball. Right. Wow. I don't think I no, I didn't know that. And, and you know, it was nowhere near you know even sure. close to what they are today, but sure. Mr. Kaufman was in a position where he could write a check. Now, if the, if you know, and back then we we're putting over 2 million people in the stands every year too. Sure. Sure. And you know, the salaries were nothing comparatively what they are. Now, he may have lost money, but he could he could afford to write a say just I'm going to use a number, a $5 million check to subsidize the losses for the team. Mm -hmm. Even though he might have the highest payroll in, in baseball, he could afford to write that $5 million right. check. And he was glad to write it because he wanted a competitive team on the field. Right. I mentioned earlier, after the strike, the large market teams just started spending money like crazy. Mm -hmm. At that point, the small market teams could no longer kind of keep up with the Joneses. Mm -hmm. And if Mr. Kaufman was going to write a check to keep up with – Whatever he had to spend, it might have been a fifty million dollar check, mm -hmm. right? He wasn't going to do that. Sure, sure. But he really loved baseball, though, didn't he? He, he loved baseball. Uh, Mrs. Kaufman, hmm. I mean, she was a huge fan as well. They just were. We were fortunate to have owners like the Kaufmans who were willing to do what they did for Kansas City. Absolutely. Sure. Absolutely. So we had Alex Gordon on the show yesterday. We've had George, and th those two in particular told some stories. Because um, when I think about long-term Royals, mm -hmm. right, the guys that have been with the team for a decade, that's a long time to stay with one organization, let alone you know their entire careers, which just about was you. Mm -hmm. They told some stories of how they almost ended up with other teams throughout the course of their career. Was there any time like that? You don't have to give specifics if you don't want to, but was there any opportunity or any time that was a conversation where you, you felt like you were going to end up somewhere else? Really only one time. Um, Darren mentioned earlier, in 98, I was the Royals pitcher of the year. Mm -hmm. uh, the season ends after the 98 season. The Royals don't offer me a contract. So I'm essentially going to be sitting at home, retired, or I'm going to look for a job. And right. I wanted to pitch. I was still right. very right. – You still on, had a good year. On top of my game. You know, yeah. I, I can't remember how many saves I had, but I was – you know, I had zone the ball well. Um so going into the 99 season, I was like, I was going to sign with Baltimore. So I was going to sign with. Okay. Uh, Baltimore, the Texas Rangers, and the Chicago Cubs had all offered me multi-year contracts. Wow, wow. And the Orioles had offered me a three-year contract. And I'll never forget, I'm sitting on my sofa. This is during a you know, December time frame when you know, free agency is really kind of hot and heavy. I get a phone call, and I answer the phone. It's Cal Ripken. No kidding. <laughs> and, 
And Cal's like, hey, yes. man. He goes, hey, I heard you might have an interest in coming to Baltimore. He goes, hey, you'd love it here. It's a great place recruiting. to recruiting. Yeah. I mean, nobody in the Royals had even called me to say wow. thanks for your service, but <laughs> we're not interested anymore. Right. And I'm, I mean, literally the day I was going to sign, uh, I get a phone call from Tony Musa, our manager. Yeah. He said, hey, I heard you might be signing somewhere else. I said, yeah. I said, I go, I, I don't have many options. I go, I've got, I've got three clubs. I, and uh, I said, unfortunately, the Royals are not one of them. Yeah. He goes, well, don't sign yet. He goes, I want to make a phone call and see if I can't find a way to get, get something done. And yeah. he calls me back and he said, look, he goes, Mr. Glass says we can't pay anybody over X amount of dollars. Mm -hmm. And um, that's why you didn't get a contract because your contract last year was for more than that. And they didn't want to embarrass you by sending you a contract uh, for less than you had made before. Okay. So, did you buy that? Well, I, mean, I, I, I never thought a lot about it. I said, why? I said, w my wife and I would still love to make Kansas City home and play baseball in Kansas City. And mm -hmm. he said, well, you know, we'll make you an offer and you, know, you can decide. So they made an offer. It was about a, half of what I made the year before. Uh -huh. uh, but they built in some incentives to maybe get it close to what I made the year before. And I told my wife, she goes, we're not going to Baltimore. We're going to, <laughs> we're, we're staying in Kansas City. But we had four children, you know. Right. So, oh, sure. Yeah. And that's the thing yeah. a lot of people don't realize is that, you know, we're, we're athletes. We're on the field. We're doing our job. And you're watching us on TV and cheering for us. Yeah. But we're also, uh, you know, the head of the household. Yeah. You know, we're the, you know, we're, we're, we have family and we have uh, our wives are taking care of our four children and mm -hmm. getting them, you know, to practices and to schools and to events and such. So it's, uh. A big strain on the family. Oh, it's huge. Uh, you know, when you're on a road, if I, I was going to be taking a six month road trip if Literally. I went somewhere else. Literally, because you're not going to pack up the house and right. the wife and four kids and go to Baltimore. What's interesting, so we almost had the exact same conversation with Alex Gordon because, you know, he retired and the guy is just in phenomenal shape, right? Yeah. Yep. Probably could have played another year or two or if, if he wanted to. He could still be playing. Yeah, he, <laughs> yes. yeah, he could literally still be playing, right. but you get, he said, yeah, I. I wanted to spend more time with the kids, yep. hang out with the wife, see them grow up. So, no, to totally get it because, I mean, you literally would have been in Baltimore for three years. Three years. And my right? daughter, the 99, which was my last year, my daughter was starting high school. And I knew mm, that's yeah. going to be a very you know, important time uh, for me to be there and be part of our life. Yeah. No, that's fantastic. Wow. So, So talking about... The, the end of the career, and I love the stories, right, right Bobby? Dude, that's why going, we do this, this show, right? Great. I love I it. mean, Cal Ripken doing a recruiting call, that's pretty awesome, man. So you retire. What was the transition? Did, did you kind of have a feeling that you wanted to go into the broadcasting aspect of, of, of baseball? Did you have any inkling after you retired that you were going to start going in that direction? I really didn't. And, I, I mean, I'll start on the day I retired. Um, I mentioned 99 is my last season. I had a hip injury that really hampered me during the course of the year. So physically, uh, I, I limped to the finish line. Essentially, mm -hmm. I literally limped to the finish mm -hmm. line getting to the end of the season. Really uh, struggled with uh, my right hip health, which eventually had my hip replaced, and it's all good now. But right. I was not going to be able to pitch at that level with the, with the mm -hmm. injury I had. Um, so I retire. I mentioned that uh, that year the Royals had uh, they gave me a kind of a low base contract with incentives – uh, one of my incentives was to pitch in 50 games, and I pitched in 49 games. Of course. Oh, my <laughs> oh, the, the last game of the season here in Kansas City was a Sunday, and get to the ballpark, and it's raining like crazy. It's like 40 degrees and rainy and ugly, and it's going to rain all day long. And they canceled the game like at 10 in the morning. <laughs> Did they so, really? <laughs> so my last game, <laughs> oh, no. my last game, they called off early, right? Oh, oh my gosh. So I, I, you know, I got there early. I knew it was going to be my last game, and you know, I uh, did my – pre-game, you know, warm-up and conditioning, all that. Probably having a good idea we weren't going to play, but I did it anyway, so I do it. They call off the game. I go in the clubhouse. I take off my uniform. I throw it into the dirty clothes, you know, hamper. I go in the shower, and I just start crying. Oh, man. I mean, I'm crying like a baby, and I can't stop crying. And I realize that's the last time ever I'm going to mm. put on that uniform. Oh, wow. And it was so hard for me. It was so hard. Yeah. I got that cry on my system. I came in put my clothes on and I never looked back. That no was, kidding. I never wow. once said, I wish I could do it again. Right. I mean, I would have done it until I was 88 if, you know, sure. if, you know Father Time's still undefeated, right? But, right. Um, I would have done it forever. I loved it. But I got that out of my system. Uh, I remember my wife had a uh, little Chiefs watch party that day. Some friends came over and uh, had a great time. Then uh, I always had a dream of coaching my boys. 
Uh, my dad coached me growing up in Little League and Babe Ruth and you know, American Legion Baseball. Sure. And I always wanted to do it with my boys. And I remember I played for the Billings Mustang. The first team I ever played on was in 83. I was drafted by the Reds. I go to Billings, Montana. The team is called the Billings Mustangs. And I always thought, you know what? I want to have Monty's Mustang someday. Monty, Monty's Mustang. Monty's Mustang. Heck yeah. So I started uh, thinking about, you know, I'm going to have a team. We had Monty's Mustangs and our uniforms that were white with red. They looked a lot oh. like the, 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 the Billings Mustangs uniforms, yeah. right? So um, I started coaching, and I did that for nine years. Five years with my older boy and then four years with my younger son. So for nine years, I coached amateur baseball. You asked me about the broadcasting thing, and here I am that winter, about this time of year, uh, I get a phone call from the Royals' Mike Swanson. Oh, yeah, mm-hmm. Swanee. And he said, uh, hey, you have any interest in doing some TV work for us? I'm like, you know, Swanee, I never really thought much about that, but, you know, I, I, I'll give it a shot. I'll give it a shot. So that was, you know, December, January, whenever it was. And I don't think anything else about it. I don't hear, any, I don't hear a word. What was it about 2010-ish? Yeah, pr- probably right? 2009, yeah. 2010. 2009, 10. Yep. yep. And uh, so I, sometime in May, I get a phone call from Kevin Shank, who is the Royals television producer. Okay. Kevin Shank calls me and said, hey, he goes, I heard you might have some interest in doing some TV. I'm like, yeah, I talked to Swanee, like back in the winter. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, the season started already, right? Yeah, the season already started. He goes, yeah. he goes you have any interest still? I go, I, I guess. He goes, well, can you be here today at 3 o'clock? Oh, my. <laughs> so I go, sure. Yeah, yeah. I, what do I wear? He goes, coat and tie, beer at 3 o'clock. So I go there, um, started my TV career. Did so they I, have you on the air that day? On the air that day, yeah. No, you're kidding. I <laughs> feel like I saw your first broadcast. Well, it was, it was terrible, so well, it, it would be memorable. <laughs> <laughs> Let, so I actually have a, a question, a bullet point that I wanted to talk about this. So it was a perfect segue. Right. Talk maybe about your early struggles of – Literally, I didn't know the story that it just was like a light switch. But talk about the struggles of going from player, you know, father, coach of of kids to all of a sudden, literally overnight. Now I'm a TV personality because we talked we talked with um, with Holtzy the other day, mm-hmm. and we've talked a lot with with the Fever Ryan talking yep. about the amount of preparation that goes in for every single broadcast, um, just everything. So maybe just discuss what that process and what that journey was like for you well from the day i retired to the day i started doing tv everything is really easy because coaching you know baseball mm-hmm. was in my blood it was very easy it's great for me to have that bond and a relationship with my mm-hmm. sons and you know the the teammates that was really that that was my baseball fix mm-hmm. um, now i will also preface it's unfortunate as to why i started tv the reason I started television because Paul Splittorf was dealing with some yep. uh, his throat oh, cancer. Oh, that was the reason. That's okay. why I do remember that game because it, I was like, "This is different." Yeah. Right. So that, do you think you know him with coming down with that? That was really the onus of like, "Hey, Jeff, you're up. We need you." Right. They needed somebody when Split was having some treatments and therapy and such that it was he was just uh, out of energy speaking. and he, he yeah. needed. Mm-hmm. They just needed somebody. Like almost to be a reliever, come in out of the pen that's and right. help out, you know, wow. when you need it. So that that's that. the unfortunate situation as to why mm. I started this. So, okay. but anyway, up to that point, everything was pretty easy. Now broadcasting is hard. I mean, it's especially for a, you know, let's call me an ex jock. You know, I'm, I never had any training. I didn't go to school to study broadcast mm. journalism. There's no preparation. I mean, we're, I'm they're using they're telling me things in my ear. I'm like, what does that mean? I don't know what that means. I don't. That terminology means nothing to me. Right. Yeah. And it just so it's really hard. And and I always describe it like this. So if you saw the first one, here's what it would sound like. You get in a car, and they give you the keys to a say a a, a NASCAR at the speedway, and they mm-hmm. say you go drive that car 200 miles an hour, and you're out there driving Good 200 luck. miles an hour, and you're scared to death. You know, it's like. Finally, get it 200 miles an hour. You, you get done. You give them the keys. They, oh my God, I'm I'm just glad I made it through yeah. Yeah. without yeah. crashing, right? And that's the way it is when you first start start doing live TV. It's like unbelievably fast. It's coming at you 200 yeah. miles an hour. Yeah, I can't even imagine like the nerves you're feeling, or maybe you're so busy with everything coming at you, you don't have time to be nervous. Well, I was I, I was I wasn't nervous like I would be nervous up to it start. Then you were not nervous, but you're also not very good. You're not very polished. 
But then the next time you drive the car around the track 200 miles an hour, you're like, okay, that was a little bit easier the first time. And then the mm-hmm. next time it's easier. And it's just like that's the way broadcasting is like a lot of careers. You know, it's just experience is good. Now, I do remember uh, one of our producers from St. Louis was in. This was during my first month or so. And he's like, just slow down. He goes, just, you know, he goes, don't try to drive 200 miles an hour. Just slow down. Let things come to you. Yeah. So I, I go, how long is it going to take till I feel good and comfortable? He goes, probably about two to 300 reps. I'm like, wait, two or 300 shows? That's like three years. You know? right. <laughs> he goes, yeah. yeah. And he was right. I mean, it takes a couple years before you really feel like you've got it down to the mm. point um, everything's coming at you and it's just at a slow speed. You kind of find your groove, yeah. your cadence. And yeah. the other thing, you talk about all the preparation that goes into it. Mm-hmm. Now, we're very fortunate to have Dave Holtzman because Dave Holtzman takes a lot of the heavy lifting away yeah, from the broadcasters. He's I mean, w- a lot of it. He's wicked smart. His show just dropped today. Uh, on the sh- on our podcast, yeah. so it's kind of cool that we're discussing this side of the business. So what's really cool, Monty? So he actually gave us a sample of his game notes, his eight pages, his yes. eight pages, <laughs> and the highlights, and yeah. just the unbelievable amount of stats that are on there. And he's talking about how he has his special websites that he goes to to extract the information and put it together for all you guys. I mean, it's true. I mean, he is like a rain man when it comes to the baseball stuff. So before we had Holtzy. All that information was generally derived from something that we would want to get ourselves. So that eight pages mm. would take – I know it takes wholesale hours and hours to put that together. Mm-hmm. We would spend hours and hours getting our information. Now, of the, of the eight pages that we get from Holtzy, there are certain things that I use every day, okay, because a lot of times on our pregame show, I'm, I'm previewing – our pitcher, their pitcher, uh, talking okay. about you know what's going on, and also right. we'll talk about some other players, you know, who's hot, who's not, things like that. Holtzy gives us all that. Now, before Holtzy, uh, again, I know I'm going to be talking about uh, you know, uh, whoever it might be, uh, Garrett Cole from the Yankees, mm-hmm. I'm, and I go do my own research on Garrett Cole mm-hmm. and find out when he's drafted, you know, where's he play, what's he. Do? I'd have to go do all that myself, but right. now it's very easy. I mean, Holtzy has been. We've been very fortunate because I share Holtz's notes with other TV broadcasters, <laughs> like a good friend of mine, former Royal Pat Tabler, is, oh, a, yeah. is, Pat is, Tabler. is a Blue Jays uh, color analyst. And I'll give him I've, – I've, I, first time I showed him Holtz's notes, he goes, this wow. is unbelievable. He goes, this is unbelievable. Right. He goes, can you give them to me for tomorrow? I, I, so every time we play the Blue Jays in the morning, I get a text message from, from Tabby saying, hey, I need those Holtzy notes. <laughs> yeah. So awesome. you just send them over to I just, him? I just email them to him. That's amazing. And, and he, goes, he goes, they make me look so smart. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Holtzy, you're welcome. That's this fantastic. A great shout out. <laughs> this is so random, but you mentioned Pat Tabler. That reminds me of, you know, Pat Tabler was traded to the Royals in the Bud Black deal. And I remember George Brett was no, not so happy about that because oh, yeah. he was super tight with Bud Black. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, the irony of that is that Pat Tabler and I uh, eventually lived next door to each other in Cincinnati. No wow. Okay. The, the, the the even more interesting part is that particular day that Bud Black was traded to the Indians and Tabby comes to the Royals. Jeff Montgomery comes from that trip I was on in College World Series in Omaha. Uh huh. To Kansas City, and Bo Jackson goes on a disabled list. So I took Bo's spot on the on the on roster, the roster. Wow. and it, so Tabby and I arrived in Kansas City on exactly the same day. How cool is that? <laughs> what a story! <laughs> and now you guys are still buddies to this oh, day. Oh, great friends! Yeah, wow, that's amazing. That is wow. fantastic. So stuff. you know, we were back. We we're talking about great seasons for you, and '93 was one of them. Um, I think the '93 season, if I'm not mistaken, I, you may not know this. You got you were 13th in the AL MVP vote. I didn't know that. Ninety three, no. good stuff, Bobby. Yeah, nice research, man. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I was serious. I was like, whoa, he's you got MV, you got a couple MVP yeah. votes. Well, 40, forty-five saves. I mean, that at the time t- uh, tied Quisenberry, didn't it? It did. Yeah. 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 Greg Holland eventually blo- broke that record, and mm-hmm. people would always come to me and say, "What do? You, how do you feel? You know, if Holland breaks your record?" I go, "That is not my record. That is Quiz's record." Mm. Yeah. Right, quizzes record. Yeah, exactly. That's that's cool. Because I mean, essentially, you were coming from a, a line of really good relievers. You know, you had quiz, you know, and then we had far for a little bit, and then you stepped right in and took that role for a very long time. So that's really cool. That, that's really cool. Hey, uh, I had another. So I just have these random questions just pop yeah. in my head. So I wanted to go back real quick on that forty nine. You had forty nine games in in your last season, right? You had one more to hit the fifty. So as a player, 
is that when you like before the game you hit up your manager and say, "Hey, bro, um, yeah, I've got one more game in my contract for this." I mean, does does that stuff happen? It may have. It didn't happen with me. I knew I wasn't going to pitch that day. Okay. I, I knew he he had pitched on Saturday night, uh-huh. and I think maybe because he knew it was going to rain on Sunday. Okay, but mm. I'm sure the Royals told him there's no way you let him get to fifty. <laughs> Jeez. Insider trading, man. right? Exactly. Wow. Exactly. It was just. I mean, it was. Just, I mean, I, I'd sat for like. You know, I, I probably pitched once or twice in the last, you know, 10 days of the season. You know, mm-hmm. there, it was pretty obvious to me that things were slowing down hurry. Yeah, they're slowing down hurry. <laughs> I, I was just curious, like, if, you know, with players and incentives in their contracts, if it's the last week or two, um, if they air that out, you know, to the clubhouse and be like, hey, if I get X amount of bats, uh, bats I get this amount of money. Well, if I, if, if I would have felt like I had earned that right, I, sure. I, I probably would have made – more of an effort, but I, I struggled so much that year. Gotcha. I, I pitched for 17 seasons, and I had one terrible year, and that was it. Mm, I was right. – I, I mean, I didn't – I mean, a lot of people were saying you should retire. It's embarrassing, you know, to go out and, you know, pitch the way you are, which it was tough. But sure. I, I also wasn't going to quit. Right. Somebody so. that we had on the show, I'm having a, a – diff- oh, it was Leo. He told some stories on when he was going through his injuries. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, he went through some – some crazy injuries and then came back and he told a story about how a lot of the the Kansas City sports writers had written some stories like get out of here like we're over you Leo like it's time for you to hang it up and that actually bothered him Mm -hmm. right but it it bothered him but it also motivated him so as you're talking about your your final year of struggles and your in your final year of your career were things like that happening? Were you bothered by it? Maybe just talk a little bit about the the human side of a professional athlete. Yeah, it was really tough because you know, you go out and you work hard for yourself, your family, your team in your city, mm-hmm. and you and you do everything you can. Um, and then when things are going great, everybody loves you, right? And then when things turn, it's really tough. Now we had a a columnist here named Jason Whitlock at the time. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. And, 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 uh, Jason, he was a big proponent of me retiring. I mean, he wrote columns about, you know, it's embarrassing for me to go out there. In fact, I'll never forget there was a sign. There was a picture of it, I think, in the star, but somebody's holding up a relief, um, or holding up a sign out says, how do we spell relief? And it's spelled out retirement. Instead, oh. of, ro- instead of rollades, <laughs> how do we spell yeah. relief? Yep. Yeah. Retirement. And um, it was, you know, they were making a point to me that I should retire. And I, and honestly... Um, I just had so much desire to finish a season. Mm-hmm. I didn't want I, I, to me, it would have been quitting. Sure. Um, whether you're going good, you're going bad, you make a commitment to a team, they make a commitment to you, you, you stick with it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, it says a lot about your character, right? And, and other guys that go through something like that and just want to grind and do whatever it takes to get to the finish line. Exactly. Exactly. So, Monty, let, let's talk about some stories that obviously you can share. We don't want any, you know, anything uh, <laughs> that you can't reveal. We can do that off air. But uh, what, what are some of uh, – is there one or two stories that really stick out in, in your career, whether it's, you know, your, your minor league days, your major league, even broadcasting? Wow, so many. I mean, I, I'm trying to think of some we have, teammates. We have three hours left, so <laughs> take your stories to come to mind here. Um, you know, a lot of times people ask me about George. And George was just an incredible teammate. Um, it didn't matter if you had a day in the major leagues or 10 years in the major leagues. Uh, George made you feel very comfortable, like you deserved to be there, like you belonged on that team. And I'll never forget the first time we go to Fenway Park. It, was, it would have been in 88, probably June of 88. And I remember we had a night game Friday, day game Saturday, day game Sunday. So... Friday night, game's over. I'm walking in the concourse of Fenway Park to go to the bus. And George's like, hey, rookie, where are you going? I go, I'm just going to take the bus back to the hotel. And he goes, ah, no, you're not. You're coming with us tonight. Oh, boy, here we go. <laughs> so we go out, and it was one of those all-nighters. I mean, literally, I, I don't. You got a day game the next day? I, yeah, but I didn't know it at the time, but George been told he had Saturday off. Oh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so George's got Saturday off, right? So... I, I mean, I don't know if we saw the sun come up, but it was pretty close to the time the oh sun's coming gosh. up in the morning. Oh, wow. 
you know, I'm only 26 at the time. I can handle it. There's no sure. big deal. Yeah. And I'm a relief pitcher. I only got to throw an inning. So <laughs> I, I can handle it. But I, I'll never forget, we get on the bus on, on the next morning, and George just, you can tell from looking in his eyes that, you know, he's he's – He's on green around the gills. Right. right. We all we all felt probably the same, but you know, George probably at the time was thirty five, is my guess. I don't even remember for sure how old he was, but he you know, he had a lot of experience at the time. Mm -hmm. But he's got a day off, right? Yeah. So we get to the ballpark. And George never rode a bus. George always would go early and work out and but that day he's riding a bus. <laughs> so <laughs> Skipped his workout. Right. As soon as we get there, our manager, John Wathan, so Duke calls George in the office. He goes, you're in the lineup. Oh, shit. No. <laughs> he said, Willie's sick. <laughs> you're in the lineup. That's so phenomenal. George goes yeah. out and hits three balls off the green monster. Get out. Oh, you're kidding. Three doubles. No kidding. And that's just the way George that's rolled. George. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> that's incredible. Probably was just dragging himself and... It's just like, oh, whatever. Just slap it. Yeah, just go. Feel you, know, you, you know what's funny about that is, oh, just a few years ago, Dayton Moore had a charity wiffle ball tournament. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> I'm pitching. And George goes to the plate. He's got three bats. Like his silver slide. Three. He's got three uh, like wiffle, wiffle ball, ball bats, uh -huh. right? Yeah. So I get in, in the ball bucket, and I grab two more balls. So now i got three balls in my hand. Yeah. And I throw three balls at George, right? And he hits one of them out of the park. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so Of course he does. <laughs> so we're doing a little radio interview afterwards, and and uh, whoever's interviewing said, how about George hitting the home run? And, and, and uh, I said, well, I didn't I didn't really know if, if he had a chance, but he had three bats. I'm going to throw him three balls. He goes, well, George already told us that there were a lot of times that he saw three baseballs, and he had always hit the middle one. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Got the Google, googly <laughs> eyes. That's amazing. That's, That's amazing. good. How about okay? Along the line of stories, if past teammates were going to talk about Monty and tell some stories about Monty or talk about some quirks, what would some some past teammates tell us about you? Someone would say I, I was very superstitious. Uh, I I don't think that I was real superstitious. Like Kevin Apier level? No, but like. I would always try to run at around four o'clock every day. Okay, um, and they would always say, "Oh, it's four o three. Here he goes." You know, it's like that. But that I didn't do it because I was superstitious. I had to run at four o three or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. It was because that's what worked for me. Mm -hmm. And I just had a program that I worked off of. And there were a few times when circumstances would mean that I couldn't do that. You know, maybe there was like a old timers game on the field or something's going on where I couldn't do my routine, so I'd do it sometimes after the game. Mm. I got a good story about it after the game here in a minute. but So I, I, you, the times I didn't do my routine, I would pitch. It just didn't seem like I had quite the same sharpness. Mm. You know, Sound so, familiar, DC? So yeah. oh, routines? Oh. I'd always find a way to do it, You know, do my routine. I knew what worked for me, and, and that's really kind of what happened. And, and that reminds me, one of, the, one of the days I couldn't get my routine in for one reason or another, uh, I come in and I pitch. And I didn't do real well. I remember we were losing by a, quite a quite a few runs, and we're playing the at the time the Indians. So I'm going to get my workout in. I think I came in and pitched the eighth inning, maybe just to get some work. So I pitched the inning, come in, take off my uniform. I get on the treadmill right right off the clubhouse there on mm -hmm. the, in the exercise room. So I'm on the treadmill. I'm running. I'm I'm now I'm running like for like 20 25 minutes, and I'm watching the game on the TV, and we're like. We have a big rally. Oh, shoot. We're scoring runs. We yeah. scored like 10 or 11 runs. It's one oh of the biggest gosh. comebacks ever. Nice. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, I'm the pitcher. I'm, I'm in the game. <laughs> now, so I run out into the clubhouse to get my uniform, and the club is there. Tom, uh, Tommy Walsh is there. I go, T-Man, where's my uniform? He goes, it's in, the it's in the washing machine. Oh, my gosh. And you're still in the game. I'm still in the game. Oh. And I don't even realize it. I, I mean, I just I, – I, <laughs> I thought it was over. You know, I thought I'm not going back out there. Yeah. So – he runs and gets gets my spare uniform, my second uniform. I, I suit up real quick. The inning's over. Now I'm, I'm running down the tunnel to get to the dugout. To, and, and Bruce Keeson, our pitching coach, he goes, hey, that's all right. He goes, somebody's got the ninth. So, oh, oh, my <laughs> gosh. <laughs> but did you have your jersey on or got, did you have someone else's no, jersey No, I had my on? jersey on. <laughs> he, I got my, he got my spare uniform uh, out of the trunk or whatever. Oh, wow. my gosh. That's hilarious. <laughs> Would any past teammates uh, say anything about, like, do you have any, did you have any quirks besides your, your daily routine? No, I mean Mark Gubazade. Always he always um, 
You see, always say I'd pop out of a manhole. They'd be somewhere, and I'd always pop up out of the manhole. Wherever they would be, I would always find a way to <laughs> find them. Find you know? them. <laughs> Man, it would be cool to get Gooby on the show. Tell that yeah. story about the the plane with George. Oh yeah, uh, exactly. Wonder if Gooby gets all those stats. You know, obviously he does the, oh, the, some for announcing the angels, for the yeah. Angels, right? Wonder if he gets all that that fun stuff. Did but you did you touch base with him at all? Like when you were first getting in, like hey, some tips, some pointers. Yeah, I, I would reach out to you know I have a lot of contemporaries who are doing what I do now, mm -hmm. um, and everybody pretty much the same thing. And and one of the best piece of advice I ever got was from Paul Splitorf. Split said, look, he goes, I don't care how good of a player you were, how good a player you were, it doesn't matter. You're an, you're an announcer now. You're a broadcaster. He goes, when you show up to work every day, you be ready to work. You be ready to do your job, prepare for it. He goes, mm -hmm. the biggest thing I see from guys who don't make it, they just show up thinking they're just going to mm, just, just wing just it. Gonna wing it and make right. it happen. And uh, the other thing he said was, you know, there are a lot of people in in this game that get paid a lot of money, you know, to to do a job. And if they don't do the job, it's okay to go home and and, and not sleep at night. He goes, "You're not one of those people." He goes, right. "You're not one of those people." He goes, "You have a bad game as as, a, as an announcer. Don't go to the hotel and beat yourself up. Mm, sure. Just just he goes, you're going to remember it. Almost everybody's going to forget it." It's true. People aren't yeah. going to marry. He goes, you, he goes, you're not one of those people that are paid to go home and lose sleep over having a bad mm. day. Man, what's some great feedback, you know, from yeah. a mentor like that. That's really That's cool. That's really, really good. So speaking of, uh, you know, announcing, is there like a, a particular favorite city, whether you're a player or as announcers, do you have like one or two cities that you really enjoy going to during the baseball season? Yeah, they're all, they're all really good. Uh, there are some ballparks that are more difficult than others. Uh, as far as like the broadcast booth and such, mm -hmm. um, but there are a lot of great ballparks, and you know there's a lot of discussion now with regards to you know Kauffman Stadium building a new ballpark downtown. Right. And I think anybody who would go to one of the new ballparks versus what we've had for 50 years here at Kauffman, and, and believe me, I've had so many memories, and I love Kauffman Stadium. But if you go to a new ballpark, you would mm. say, "Gosh, wow, we could use a new <laughs> ballpark." Oh, absolutely. So my wife and I, we had the privilege of. Last summer, we had a wedding, and we had to go through Georgia. So we had a layover in Atlanta. I'm like, let's just stay a night. Let's, you know, we're trying to hit all the ballparks, right? And we've got 19 or, or 20 of them done now. So we went to, uh, I think it's Truist Park mm -hmm. in Atlanta. Uh, saw Kevin Seitzer, the hitting coach. And, but anyway, just the ballpark, the amenities, the restaurants, the hotel. I mean, there was such a vibe around that whole stadium that you really just can't replicate. And we love Kaufman, right? It, it's yep. it's fantastic, mm -hmm. but I can totally understand what they're trying to do to bring it really kind of a family feel. But uh, man, it's just a whole vibe that you can't really replicate with what we have right now. Right, I mean, and I think having you know all the discussion with regards to location and parking and all the all the all the naysayers mm -hmm. that have all these other cities have found a way to figure it out. Sure, and I think there are smart enough people here that can do the same. Absolutely. But, uh, I'm sure it's uh, going to be a lot of hoops and hurdles to get through, but eventually um, I'm hopeful that we have a chance to experience that. Exactly, exactly. Will, yeah. So speaking of new stuff, any uh, <laughs> of the upcoming players, some of the new guys that, uh, you know, I know we, we've got Bobby Witt Jr. Is there any, some you know, we've got a, a lot of young guys that are up and coming. They look really good. Is there anyone that you're really particularly excited about? I'll focus on a couple young pitchers that, to me, I saw a lot of uh, a lot of potential from. Obviously, it's easy to look at Brady Singer, what he's done. We know the potential with regards to mm -hmm. all those other 2018 draft mm -hmm. guys, and really, mm -hmm. if you throw Jonathan Heaston in, there are five guys who had 18 drafts. So all those guys that are in the 18 draft, they all have a chance to become Brady Singer at some point. N not all of them will. That's right. just the way baseball is. Sure. Somebody will get hurt. Somebody just won't make it. Um, but I like the stuff that they all have. And I think that a, a chance for a couple more of those guys to emerge and be very solid, you know, major league pitchers, I think that exists. I think that's there. Um, if you remember last year, we went to Toronto. It's, that's that, what we call the COVID trip when all the players mm, that yeah. didn't have the vaccination couldn't go. Right. We called up a kid named Angel Zerpa, left-handed pitcher. Mm -hmm. And this guy really, to me, uh, shows signs of being – a solid guy. I mean, he's, he's not an overpowering, not a dominant guy, but he's really, uh, he's got 
that high level of confidence in himself. Uh, he works quick. Mm-hmm. Um, he just he's a guy that I think's got a chance to be pretty good. It's one of those under the radar type guys uh, that we'll see. And then um, I really like the way some of those younger bullpen arms kind of started turning the corner last year uh, and, and started kind of believing themselves mm-hmm. and going out mm-hmm. there and. Just like confidence, like yeah. we're talking about. Yeah, and, and that's so important, um, regardless of your position, but especially if you're a pitcher. I talked to you earlier about Bob Boone, you know, telling me, hey, don't mm-hmm. throw the inside corner, don't throw the outside corner. We always, I always said the bottom corner. That's a pretty big corner, <laughs> you know, and, and, and right. once you have that confidence that your stuff plays, then it's easy to go out and do your job. Right. And uh, I just think a lot of those – like Dylan Coleman, for example, young arm last year, mm-hmm. hit hit the ground running, had a few struggles, went to the minor leagues, came back, uh, established confidence in himself, and became a really quality guy that you go put in high leverage situations, going to do a good job for you. So I think we've got uh, the makings for a, a nice core of young players. Um, I know Jordan Lyles was signed. I, I'm yeah. hopeful we're going to sign Zach Greinke back. That'd be nice. So yeah. you know you're going to have a little mix there in the rotation because. Let's face it, you're going to need probably at least 10 starting pitchers during the course of a season mm-hmm. uh, to get through because guys are going to need a little bit of a, uh, a rest here and there, uh, especially if you bring a, a Zach uh, Grinky back. You know that you know, maybe after 10 or 12 starts, is, you know, give him a time to shut down, mm-hmm. recharge the batteries, and he's come back strong again. Uh, so I think, there's, I think there's some promising signs. Uh, when we look at the the position players, uh, one guy that had a chance to play last year, Michael Massey at second base. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I think you know once he gets to the stage where he's a more consistent contact hitter, be a solid guy. Um, and then I think we hit on 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 three of those young players already. I think Pasquantino, Melendez, and Witt. I think they've all proven mm-hmm. they're going to be long term consistent performers and big contributors to the offense. So. And then, you know, some of the other not necessarily uh, established guys, um, I, I just think there's enough in the mix that it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. But uh, I think having a new manager, um, I think it's kind of a fresh set of eyes, mm-hmm. maybe a new way of doing things. Sure. Maybe you kind of get that at next level with those. Now, I love Mike Matheny. I, I thought he was uh, a really good fit for these young players. But I wasn't in the clubhouse every day, and – have no idea what his style was in the clubhouse. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think uh, uh, Matt Quattrero is a guy who he's been around winning managers like Terry Francona and Kevin Cash down in Tampa. Mm-hmm. Uh, he understands what it takes, and he's also going to be a very, very uh, thoughtful decision maker. Yeah. Right. Uh, high hopes for sure for <clears throat> exactly. the entire fan base. And we've heard nothing but good things. And and, and how is that? You know, you, you went through that. I mean, is is that a, a fresh voice or just – you know, a few, uh, a different sense of, uh, you know, whether it's, you know, the outcomes or philosophies, or does that help, you know, mix things up a little bit with having a new manager come in? So I had five major league managers. All five were in their very first managerial job in the big, in the big leagues. So I didn't have any experienced managers. Uh-huh. Wow. The, the, the manager who, to me, really developed into the best manager was Hal McRae. And gotcha. so mm. much of that, to me, uh, goes into the fact that Hal uh, was a player who was um, he was a he was a leader, mm-hmm. and I don't care if you're managing the Kansas City Royals or if you're managing re- retail store down the street, your job is to get the most out of your employees, and I think Hal had that personality, had that leadership quality and ability to get the most out of his guys. Right. Uh, Even as a player. Right. I mean, he yeah, everybody wanted to play for him. Yep. Yep. I mean, a lot of those guys from that era told those stories. Yeah, he would kick you in the rear if you didn't do your job right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what was the story? Uh, was Willie Wilson telling us, or I forget who? But they would like wheel, like how McCray would get in a cart and they would wheel him like through the clubhouse, and uh, he would just talk trash to people. Oh so, yeah, yeah. Oh, no, no, he, yeah, he would he would be underneath all the laundry, and then he'd have somebody wheel him up to someone who was struggling. Or hurt or something like yeah, that. And yeah, and then he'd pop out and like totally call him out and say, "You don't deserve to be on this team hitting yeah. 200." Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Ro- as we're getting close here towards the end, Monty, you talk about your your intro into TV and broadcasting, but really that's not accurate. I mean, you were a, a TV slash kind of movie star with the fundamentals of pitching. Here we go. VHS that came out. 
<laughs> have you got had a chance to see it? You know, had really? I prepared better, <sighs> right. I would have got a copy off of eBay for twenty bucks and had this here for you to sign. That would have been amazing. Wow, I should have brought one for you. Yeah. <laughs> that would be awesome. Let's, you guys go buy a VHS machine, but <laughs> right? <laughs> Let's go to the antique store and find one. Well, yeah, it'd be good for uh, for a little tune up before fantasy camp. <laughs> exactly. That's awesome. That would be fantastic. Cool. Well, is there anything else, Monty, that you want to share? Kind of what you're working on right now, or anything else that. Uh, that you want to share with the audience? The biggest thing we're working on right now is my golf game. Yeah. How's that going? Because I know you're heading to Florida here. So. I'm going to Florida. I, I started playing, um, on, it's called Inner Club. So it's you're based on a golf team a okay. couple of years ago. I couldn't do it last year. I had shoulder surgery, so I was out of action. But two years ago, I played on our club team in Florida, and it starts early January. Now, obviously, I've not been able to play a lot of golf outside because of the weather we've experienced right. here recently, but right. I've got a little golf simulator in my house. So I've been I've been, been practicing. working on my game a little yeah. bit, right? right? So I'm looking forward, but it's amazing. Um, it's a lot like being a rookie in baseball. Okay, first time in big league. First time I got on the tee box on the on the inter club team. Uh-huh. I hit a ball like so far out of bounds is unbelievable. But it's all <laughs> I I I'd never played on a competitive golf yeah. team. Right. I, I was nervous. It's just like getting on the mound for the first yeah, time. Right. You know, you know, in the big leagues, but. Uh, I love the competition. I love the uh, the desire, the the urgency, mm-hmm. the need to to compete and and hopefully come out on top. Does that f- kind of fill that athletic yeah, void? It does. It gives yeah. you gives you a little adrenaline. Exactly. So with with being on the on the on the golf team, so when do you have to go to spring training? Like, do you have to go down to a surprise and do a couple games, kind of like to get warmed up, or, or like opening day, you guys just show up and you're ready to go? We generally would broadcasts about 10 games from spring training camp and, and usually about half of those games are what we call they're produced by whoever the home team is like if we're the home mm-hmm. team we'll produce it and we'll use our announcers okay. if we're playing against the brewers they'll produce it and yep. they'll we'll use their announcers so about five or six games we'll do and generally uh rex Hadler goes for half the games i go for half the games and they try to bunch them together so we've only got to go out for about a week okay um not that i don't like spring training but the season is so darn long Oh, my gosh. And the travel. And the right? travel. It's yeah. like it's just, you know, the, the, the least amount of time in spring training. Even as a player, I I love the first day of spring training, yep. but I love the last day even more. <laughs> I bet. I bet. I well, you know, one thing that I always think about, and maybe you can share with us uh, as we get closer if this is a struggle, but I couldn't imagine being on the road for six months and not just gaining 200 pounds by going out to eat and wanting to hit like all the top restaurants in the different cities. Is that ever a challenge? Well, I know as a broadcaster it is. Yeah. Because you do. You you literally find yourself eating so much more than you eat when you're at home. Mm-hmm. And uh, like we eat in the press dining, and they're always like a buffet style thing. So it's like oh, a little extra of this, a little. So I, I always put on eight or 10 pounds during the course oh, of yeah. the year. It takes me three months to, to, to trim it down. Then it all starts <laughs> over back. again opening day. It's a, it's a vicious cycle. <laughs> that sounds like uh, us training for fantasy camp. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah for sure. Well, cool, Monty. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. We appreciate your time, man. You bet. I'm glad to be here and hope we can do it again someday. We, we had to get you in before the blizzard sets in. Yeah, That's right. No yes. doubt. We appreciate so, your time. Yeah. Well, guys, this has been the Always Be Cool podcast in the Summit Lending Studios with Bobby Kerr and Darren Copeland and the one, the only, Mr. Jeff Montgomery. All right. Take care, guys. Thanks. Good job, man.